Hello everyone and welcome to Creature Archives. This is Survive, Adapt, Evolve, a series where we explore how creatures from both real life and fantasy might fare in entirely different worlds. Today we're taking one of the most iconic mammals of the Ice Age and sending it far deeper into prehistory than it ever belonged. Today we are sending giant ground sloths back to the late Jurassic and to one of the most famous dinosaur ecosystems ever preserved the Morrison Formation. To determine whether it could survive, we'll be evaluating this animal across four key categories. Habitat adaptability, dietary compatibility, competition and predation, and reproductive success. Each will be rated out of 10, leading to a final survival score. And make sure you stick around until the end because we'll also explore how giant sloths might evolve over time to better handle the dangers of a dinosaur-dominated world. Also, this episode was chosen by Community Vote, so if you want to say in what this channel explores next, make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on so you don't miss any future polls or videos. Before we go any further, let's quickly clarify exactly what species of giant ground sloth we are focusing on for this video, because there are quite a few different species, many with their own unique adaptations and physiological features. For this episode, the giant ground sloth genus we'll be using is a Remotherium, rather than the more famous Megatherium. While Megatherium is easily the most iconic of the giant sloths, it was more specialized for cooler open ice age environments. That specialization would make surviving in the hot, forested, and highly seasonal ecosystems of the Jurassic a much tougher challenge. A Remotherium, on the other hand, still gives us that same massive size and unmistakable ground sloth build, but with a key advantage. It lived in tropical and subtropical environments, browsing in warm climates that more closely resemble conditions found in the Morrison Formation. Additionally, there are two recognized species of Remotherium: Remotherium eomigrans and Remotherium laurelarde. The two are extremely similar overall, with the primary differences being their geographic range and the number of functional digits on the forelimbs, with eomigrans likely having five digits and laurelarde having three large claws. Between the two, we'll be using laurelarde as it has the wider geographic range, a somewhat more robust build, and most importantly, it is far better studied. A Remotherium thrived across a broad geographic range from southern Brazil to the Gulf and Atlantic coast of the United States. Fossil evidence shows it occupied diverse tropical and subtropical environments, ranging from dense woodlands to open savannas and grasslands. The Morrison Formation of the late Jurassic, roughly 156 to 146 million years ago, featured river floodplains, open woodlands, and forest edges, with strong wet-dry seasonal cycles. Temperatures were generally warm, and permanent rivers and wetlands could support large herbivores year-round. From a broad perspective, these habitats would feel surprisingly familiar to a Remotherium. Additionally, fossil evidence shows that giant ground sloths use their powerful forelimbs and claws for burrowing and foraging, which could provide shelter from the heat. While there isn't direct evidence for a Remotherium itself burrowing, many giant ground sloths did, and it is likely reasonable that it could dig shallow burrows to some extent, even if they were not as large or impressive as the massive tunnel systems attributed to some other species. While this burrowing behavior likely gave a Remotherium a safe refuge during extreme conditions, it also suggests it wasn't highly migratory compared to some Jurassic herbivores that could follow distant water sources. A Remotherium could still move across the landscape to reach water and forage, but it probably wouldn't track resources over the same long distances as the larger sauropods. From a habitat perspective alone, a Remotherium is well suited to the Morrison Formation. Its tropical and subtropical origins and generalist lifestyle allow it to handle warm temperatures and variable seasonal conditions. What prevents a perfect score isn't temperature or vegetation structure, but the seasonal instability and periodic concentration of water and shelter. Overall, while the Jurassic isn't a perfect fit, considering its heat adaptations, wide habitat tolerance, and generalist lifestyle, a Remotherium demonstrates a strong capacity to adapt to the Morris information, earning it a habitat adaptability rating of 8 out of 10. In its native Pleistocene habitats, Arimotherium was a highly adaptable generalist herbivore, consuming a wide variety of plant materials, including leaves, fruits, twigs, and seasonal grasses. Evidence suggests it was a mixed feeder, taking both C3 plants like trees and shrubs, and C4 grasses when available. Its diet shifted with the seasons, with C4 grasses favored during wet periods, while leaves and twigs dominated in drier months. Additionally, its foraging methods enhanced its flexibility. Its large, powerful claws could strip branches, dig for roots, or manipulate vegetation, 
While its massive size and ability to rear upright allowed it to reach high foliage, accessing resources unavailable to most other herbivores in its ecosystem. Transported to the Morrison Formation, however, Arimotherium faces a very different plant world. Grasses and abundant fruit-bearing plants, important components of its Pleistocene diet, were absent or extremely rare, as flowering plants had only just begun to emerge and were not yet ecologically significant. Instead, Jurassic flora was dominated by conifers, cycads, ginkgos, horsetails, and ferns. While it could browse on leaves and stems, much of its preferred and more easily digestible food would be missing, forcing it to rely more heavily on tough, woody vegetation. Its ability to rear upright would help it access mid- and high-level foliage, and its claws could dig for roots or strip branches, but even these advantages cannot fully compensate for the lack of fruits, grasses, and abundant soft vegetation. This limitation would likely restrict growth, reproduction, and overall energy intake, leaving Eremotherium in a more restricted ecological position compared to its native environment. In short, while the Remotherium could find food in the Morrison Formation, it would be constantly challenged by a more limited and less optimal diet, preventing it from thriving as effectively as it did in the Pleistocene. Its impressive adaptations help, but they cannot fully overcome the dietary gap imposed by Jurassic plant communities. Considering these constraints, a Remotherium earns a dietary compatibility rating of 6 out of 10. Eremotherium was already a formidable competitor in its native Pleistocene ecosystems. There it contended with other giant ground sloths, mastodons, tapirs, and a variety of medium and small-sized herbivores. Many of these competitors were similar in size and ecological role, forcing Eremotherium to navigate both direct competition for food and complex social interactions. Transported to the Morrison Formation, however, the competitive landscape looks surprisingly favorable. Most Jurassic herbivores were either giant sauropods feeding either very low or very high, or specialized browsers like Stegosaurus, which focused on specific feeding heights. Mid-sized generalist herbivores, precisely the niche a Remotherium occupies, were largely absent. Its ability to rear upright, reaching mid-level foliage, and strip branches with powerful claws allows it to exploit resources with minimal direct competition. Meaning, this Ice Age giant would likely fare better as a competitor here than it did in its native Pleistocene forest. When it comes to predation, however, the situation becomes more intense. While a Remotherium did face apex predators in its native range such as Smilodon, Homotherium, and short-faced bears, relying on its massive size and enormous claws for defense, the Jurassic predators it encounters would be far larger and more dangerous. That said, adult sloths would still be far from easy prey. An adult Remotherium could reach lengths of up to 6 meters, stand on its hind legs 4 meters tall, and weigh up to a staggering 6 tons. In comparison, Allosaurus, the most common large predator of the Jurassic, while longer at 8 to 9 meters long, only weighed 2 to 4 tons, meaning an adult sloth would have a significant weight advantage. Now, Allosaurus did already hunt comparatively large herbivores either alone or in small groups, but unlike those slower herbivores Allosaurus would typically hunt, against an adult Arimotherium, Allosaurus would be dealing with a target that could rear up towering over it, slashing with its massive claws, and was already accustomed to pivoting to fight faster prey like big cats. So, while I do believe an Allosaurus, or multiple, could occasionally take down an Arimotherium, it would be very risky for them to do so, as one good swipe from its massive claws could put an Allosaurus down for good. For a more in-depth look at this matchup, I highly recommend you go check out the Overseer's video on this topic. In his video, he focuses more on Megatherium, but many of the same principles would apply with Arimotherium being comparable in build and size. Outside of Allosaurus, Torvosaurus was even larger, reaching up to 11 meters long and weighing between 3 and 6 tons. Its power and size means that even with claws and rearing defense, a fully grown Torvosaurus would likely be capable of killing an adult sloth if the attack was well placed. Though, once again, Arimotherium would still put up a nasty fight, potentially being more trouble than it's worth. Additionally, there were smaller, more lion-sized predators like Ceratosaurus and Tanicolugrius. These animals, while formidable, likely wouldn't have the offensive power or the incentive to take on a giant sloth, and so would likely pose little threat to an adult Arimotherium, though they would certainly pose a threat to unprotected juveniles. The combination of its mid-level browsing specialization, sheer size, and formidable claws would allow Arimotherium to both exploit food resources effectively and survive the majority of predator encounters, scoring the Arimotherium a competition and predation rating of 8 out of 10. From a reproductive perspective, Arimotherium would face significant challenges in a dinosaur-dominated world. As a large mammal, it gave live birth with likely long gestation periods approaching a year or more. Its young were nursed and extensively cared for, and they probably remained with their mother in small family units or temporary social groups, which would help provide protection from predators. Fossil evidence suggests that this species occasionally gathered together near water sources, 
though whether these gatherings indicate true herding or just temporary congregations is debated. Compared to the egg-laying dinosaurs of the Morrison Formation, however, Arimotherium's slow reproductive rate is a serious limitation. Dinosaurs like Allosaurus could potentially produce multiple clutches or dozens of offspring per year, allowing populations to rebound more quickly after predation or environmental stresses. Even with parental care, protective behaviors, and the use of shallow burrows or natural shelters, the sloth's population would likely struggle to maintain numbers, especially given the presence of numerous opportunistic predators. Arimotherium's strategy favors the survival of individual offspring. Parental care, shelter use, and temporary social groupings would all increase juvenile survival, and its long lifespan, likely several decades, would partially offset the slow reproductive rate. However, in a world dominated by fast reproducing and dangerous dinosaurs, population growth would still be far slower than that of its competition, making reproductive success one of the most limiting factors in its overall ability to thrive in the Jurassic. This scores the Arimotherium a Survive Adapt Evolve score of 6.5 out of 10. While it certainly wouldn't dominate in the Morrison Formation, it holds its own surprisingly well for a mammal living in a world of reptiles. Its size and claws give it strong defenses, and it faces relatively little competition in its browsing niche. That said, there are clear challenges. Its diet would be less ideal, relying on Jurassic plants without the fruits and grasses it normally prefers. And its slow reproductive rate severely limits population growth compared to the fast-breeding dinosaurs around it. Overall, Arimotherium could survive, but its ecological success would likely be moderate. Before we dive into the speculative evolutions, I want to as always give a shout out to this channel's amazing artist, Delta Reaper 54 Most of the creature art you see on this channel, including the art of the speculative evolutions you're about to see, were created by him. So, if you enjoy his art, be sure to check out more of his work. His info is in the description below. In the predator-rich world of the late Jurassic Morrison formation, Arimotherium faced pressures very different from its Ice Age habitats. While adults could fend off many threats with size and claws, juveniles were vulnerable, and the sprawling landscape combined with intense predation and seasonal resource shifts created strong selective pressures. Over generations, one lineage responded by adopting a fully subterranean lifestyle, prioritizing safety and social cooperation. The result is Terratherium communis, the communal earth beast. Terratherium is smaller and more compact than its above-ground ancestors measuring around 3 meters long, 1 meter tall at the shoulder, and weighing roughly 900 kilograms. Its body is muscular and barrel-shaped, with short robust limbs specialized for digging. The forelimbs are slightly longer than the hind limbs, each tipped with massive curved claws designed to excavate tunnels and strip roots. Its skull is wedge-shaped and small, with strong jaws for gnawing underground vegetation, small eyes adapted for low-light conditions, and a highly sensitive nose for detecting food beneath the soil. A thick tail acts as a stabilizer while digging, and its thick coarse fur protects against abrasion, blending naturally with the earth around burrow entrances. Ecologically, Terratherium is a highly social omnivorous generalist. It forages for roots, tubers, low-growing vegetation, and opportunistically preys on insects, small mammals, and reptiles. Colonies occupy vast interlocking burrow systems that protect them from apex predators like Allosaurus and Torvosaurus. Its lifestyle very much mirrors modern social burrowers like prairie dogs or meerkats. Younger raised communally, protected within the safety of the burrow system. Adults maintain the tunnels, guard entrances, and work together to deter intruders. Burrows not only shelter them from predators, but also buffer against seasonal heat and drought, something that above-ground ancestors had to endure more directly. While their reproduction remains slow compared to the surrounding dinosaurs, social cooperation and underground refuge significantly improved juvenile survival, allowing Terratherium to persist in an ecosystem dominated by far more numerous and fast-breeding species. In the Jurassic Morrison formation, Arimotherium faced an entirely new suite of challenges. Predators like Allosaurus and Torvosaurus were larger, more numerous, and far more persistent than anything it encountered during the Pleistocene. Arimotherium's ancestors, along with early ground sloths, had bony osteoderms, retained in lineages like Mylodon, but Arimotherium had lost them. However, over time, one lineage responded not by hiding underground, but by re-expressing these ancestral osteoderms and evolving them into durable chainmail-like armor. The result is Scudotherium Invictum, the shielded, unconquered beast. Scudotherium is an impressive, heavily built mammal, measuring 6 meters long, 2 meters tall at the shoulder, and weighing a staggering 7 to 8 tons. Its body is robust and muscular, with a broad torso built to withstand massive forces. The forelimbs are both powerful and shielded, with large claws served for stripping vegetation, while reinforced bony osteoderms along the forearms and shoulders act as natural shields against predatory attacks. Its hind limbs are thick and pillar-like, supporting its enormous weight and allowing it to rear upright to confront threats or reach high foliage. 
Its skull is strong and slightly domed, with pronounced jaw musculature for efficiently stripping branches. Medium-sized eyes provide adequate vision in forested habitats, while the tail is short but muscular, aiding in balance when rearing up. However, the defining feature of Scutotherium is its armor. Interlocking osteoderms cover the back, flanks, and forearms, while lighter segmented plating along the limbs ensures mobility. This configuration allows the sloth to adopt defensive postures, sitting back on its hind legs and using its heavily armored forelimbs as shields to block blows from formidable theropods. Ecologically, Scutotherium is a terrestrial generalist herbivore, browsing primarily on mid to high level foliage, but capable of low level foraging. Unlike its subterranean cousin, Teratherium, it does not rely on burrows for protection and is mostly solitary or lives in small family groups. Its reproductive strategy mirrors Arimotherium's, favoring survival of fewer offspring with extended parental care, rather than rapid population growth. Behaviorally, the armor allows Scutotherium to stand its ground against large predators. Rather than fleeing, it relies on a combination of its armor, its claws, and its shield forearms. By rearing up and presenting its armored forelimbs, even an adult Allosaurus or Torphosaurus would face serious risk in a direct confrontation. In the Morrison Formation, Arimotherium faced a world dominated by enormous predators and towering herbivores. One lineage responded by taking its size and strength to the extreme, evolving massive claws and a more upright stance to exploit high foliage and defend itself. Over generations, natural selection favored individuals with elongated forelimbs, gigantic curved claws, and reinforced tails for balance, giving rise to Gigatherium unguifier, the giant clawed beast. Gigatherium is a towering semi-bipedal sloth, stretching roughly 8 meters from snout to tail. On all fours, it stands about 3 meters tall, but when rearing to feed or defend itself, it can reach a staggering 6 meters tall and weigh between 9 and 10 tons. Its forelimbs are dramatically elongated, ending in claws nearly a meter long, while pillar-like hind limbs and a strong muscular tail provide balance and support. The torso is deep and heavily muscled, built to sustain its extreme size, while a slightly elongated neck allows access to high foliage. Ecologically, Gigatherium is a high browser, using its claws and reach to access leaves and branches. Its enormous claws are not only tools for feeding, but are formidable offensive weapons, making it a serious challenge for predators like Allosaurus or Torvosaurus. Socially, it is mostly solitary, only seeking out a mate in the breeding season. Reproduction in Gigatherium is slow, with females giving birth to a single, well-developed young that stays with the mother for several years to learn foraging and the use of its massive claws. Gigatherium relies on its sheer size, strength, and enormous claws to dominate its competition and would-be predators, making it one of the Morrison Formation's most formidable herbivores. Thanks for watching this episode of Survive, Adapt, Evolve. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you won't miss any future content. And if you want to further support the channel, consider becoming a YouTube member today. Not only will you help support me in making the best quality content I can, but you will gain sneak peeks of upcoming videos, early access to new releases, and custom emojis of some of your favorite creatures from the channel. Until next time, stay curious, and I'll see you all in the next video.